We'll come back to nucleotide catabolism, and more specifically, this playlist is dedicated to purine catabolism, although you'll also find this video in pyrimidine catabolism. In the last video, we saw that we could generate deoxyribose 1-phosphate, and then through a reaction called phosphodeoxyribomutase, which consequently is also the same enzyme as phosphoglucomutase, we could basically essentially transfer the phosphate group from the 1 position to the 5 position. And that essentially gave us this molecule right here, which is deoxyribose 5-phosphate. Well, it turns out that in order to get rid of this molecule to prevent its accumulation, you catabolize it into these two molecules right here. One 3-carbon molecule, which is called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. The other one is a 2-carbon fragment called acetaldehyde. And so keep in mind that this is a, this is a desmolase reaction, meaning we're cleaving carbon-carbon bonds. So this reaction... This is a desmolase. A desmolase is any, car any enzyme that cleaves a carbon-carbon bond. And so we're taking a 5-carbon molecule, deoxyribose 5-phosphate, cleaving a carbon-carbon bond, and we get two molecules, one 3-carbon, one 2-carbon, which are glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and acetaldehyde. And we'll kind of think about what might happen to those guys. Okay. So here's the idea. We're going to look at the mechanism of this enzyme and then kind of discuss what happens to the product. I'll draw the mechanistic steps in green. So the very first step of the mechanism is nucleophilic attack by lysine in the active site and a subsequent proton transfer. So what's essentially going to happen is lysine will do a nucleophilic attack on the aldehyde carbon of deoxyribose 5-phosphate and that's going to induce proton transfer with lysine. Okay, and not only do we have this critical lysine in the active site, but we also have a glutamic acid in the active site. So it's glutamate in the protonated state. Now the next step that's going to happen, and I have it labeled here, is we're going to get shift base formation. So the lysine lone pair here is going to kick in here and expel water. So the hydroxide will leave, and as it does, it's going to abstract a proton from this glutamate acid generating glutamate in the active site and in the process we generate this protonated shift base now just to um, have you understand this the, the utility in protonated shift bases is although the nitrogen can stabilize a positive charge it essentially is going to make this carbon right here that I'm highlighting essentially electrophilic so that the nitrogen here, which I'll circle in, in, let's do it in light blue, this nitrogen can act as an electron sink, okay? So protonated shift bases especially, the nitrogen can act as an electron sink, making this purple carbon more electrophilic, okay? So let's now look at the next mechanistic step. So this phosphate that's attached to the um, what was deoxyribose 5-phosphate, it's still on the 5 position, it's going to do a nucleophilic attack and attack this proton on water, giving it an extra proton. And then what's going to happen is the water is then going to deprotonate a critical tyrosine residue in the active site. Okay, And then the tyrosine effective anion, the phenol anion, is going to deprotonate this hydroxyl group, and then you're going to get formation of an aldehyde, and then this bond right here that I'm highlighting in yellow, these electrons right here, this bond is going to break, and it's going to collapse the shift base. Okay, And in the process, this step right here, this retroaldol addition, this is what gives the enzyme the, the term aldolase. Okay? Aldolases are enzymes that form aldehydes, and so as a result of that, they cleave carbon-carbon bonds. So in this direction, the enzyme's running, this is the step in which the carbon-carbon bond was cleaved. And so if you remember from the initial part of the video and last video, I mentioned that one product was glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and that's this molecule right here, D-glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Okay? So now there's going to be a series of proton transfers to regenerate the glutamic acid that's in the active site Okay, for the next mechanistic step. So glutamate's going to deprotonate this water, which deprotonates this water, and then that's going to deprotonate the phosphate of D-glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Okay, And so you end up with the anionic form of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and that's what exits the active site. 
Okay, so now you have this glutamate here in the protonated state. Okay, now what's going to happen is we're going to get another shift base formation. So this lone pair on the lysine amine is going to kick in here, form the shift base, and then these pi electrons right here are going to leave and break, and they're going to come out and abstract this proton from the glutamic acid regenerating deprotonated glutamate in the active site. Okay, and the very last step of this mechanism, or the last few steps, mechanistically are going to be shift base hydrolyses. Okay, so what's essentially going to happen is this glutamate is going to deprotonate a water molecule, and the actual water is going to be what does the shift base hydrolysis. So water attacks this carbon, and that's going to destroy the shift base, having this nitrogen right here act as an electron sink because this carbon right here, this carbon is significantly more electrophilic, so it's prone to being nucleophilically attacked. Okay. In the very last step of the mechanism, what's going to happen is we're going to lose the lysine. That's going to be our leaving group. So essentially what's going to happen is this lone pair is going to come out here and abstract this proton from the hydroxyl group, causing carbonyl formation and loss of a leaving group. So the lysine is one of the products. Again, in the last step, we generated our glutamic acid, which is how it existed at rest. And then we also generate acetaldehyde. And what we'll find out in the next video, we'll look at the mechanism there as well, the acetaldehyde can react with a very special, a very special aldehyde dehydrogenase. And what we're going to end up getting at the end of that reaction is we're going to end up getting acetyl CoA. So hopefully this video gave you a little bit of intuition on the mechanism and physiology of what happens to deoxyribose 5-phosphate. So we have glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. The question is what happens to that? Well, just bear in mind that glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate can actually go into glycolysis. And so if we look at the structure of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, it basically looks like this. So here is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and the question is, what happens to it? Well, keep in mind, it's going to react with an enzyme called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. Remember, this is a glycolytic enzyme, and if we're going in the direction of glycolysis, what we're going to get out of this reaction is, number one, we're going to get our first NADH out of glycolysis, and the main product of this enzyme so let me draw this now. The main product of this enzyme is going to be 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, the common name for this, or the abbreviation, whatever you want to call it, people usually abbreviate this as 1,3-BPG, and then this will react with phosphoglycerate kinase and that will generate our first ATP. So it turns out that whenever you use um, purine nucleoside phosphorylase and you end up generating that deoxyribose 1-phosphate, you mutate it into deoxyribose 5-phosphate and then you aldolize it into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and it turns out that the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate can actually be used for energy production. So this will go into glycolysis, you'll get out an NADH and then you use phosphoglycerate kinase, you get out an ATP per reaction, and then that will go and eventually react with pyruvate kinase to give us another ATP. So this is energy yielding overall, and then also the acetaldehyde that's produced in this reaction of aldehyde dehydrogenase, not only do we get an acetyl-CoA that will go into the TCA cycle and react with citrate synthase, but something that might not be apparent to you at first, and we'll look at this in the next video, but this reaction also produces an NADH. So actually, when we catabolize deoxyribose 1-phosphate, we get a pretty decent amount of energy per catabolism. So hopefully this video helped you with the reaction mechanism and physiology of deoxyribose 5-phosphate aldolase. In the next video, we'll look at the special mechanism of this particular aldehyde dehydrogenase that's going to catabolize acetaldehyde. See you in the next video.